Hello class, this is Professor Allen, and here is Lecture Day 18 for American History. And this lecture is going to cover three major topics, and they are the Louisiana Purchase, the Lewis and Clark Expedition, which actually explores part of the Louisiana Purchase, as well as some other land. And then the final one is, of course, who shot Alexander Hamilton. So let's go ahead and jump right into the background of the Louisiana Purchase. And so the background of the Louisiana Purchase is relatively simple. Obviously, what? Spain owns Louisiana at this time, in the year 1800, and Louisiana at this time is anything that really is drained by the Mississippi River that isn't also owned by the United States. And so that would be some of this area is kind of drained by the United States, by the Mississippi River in the United States, these territories here, as well as some of the rivers here as well. Um, but for what intensive purposes is Louisiana is this area down here where we of course live, as well as all the way up in this direction, uh, which has tons of tons of rivers all draining into the Mississippi River. And so at this time, uh, American settlers are expanding from the original 13 colonies into further and further west, right? And we've got these territories set up, we've got these territories set up, which is basically what? Alabama and Mississippi, as well as a bit of Arkansas in there. And so we've got quite a lot of territory being explored by the Americans, but at this point, America kind of starts wanting to start using the Mississippi River, and for a while we have a treaty with Spain who owns the Mississippi River and New Orleans to be able to do that. But things are going to kind of start changing um, because of a treaty that we actually don't end up finding out about until all of a sudden when we go to the Spanish government to talk to renewing the uh, contract to using the Mississippi River again for another few years, we are told that they no longer own Louisiana. And so who ends up owning Louisiana during that little kind of period, and why? Well, that's because of the Treaty of Ildefonso, which was signed in 1801. It's actually a secret treaty between the governments of France and Spain. And at this time, there was a man named Napoleon Bonaparte, who was uh, in charge of France. He and um, others helped um, uh, revolt in France and overthrew the king in France. And uh, they replaced hit, um, uh, it with another government for a little while, and then eventually that government was re actually replaced with Napoleon himself as their leader, and then he eventually became um, elected as an emperor. Um, and so it actually became a hereditary title, which he planned on passing down to his children, um, but or at least to other family members, if anything were to happen to him. Um, all of that is a uh, Western Civilization II class discussion, which I actually teach next uh, spring, or this coming spring, but... Uh, it's a lot more complicated than we need to talk about in here. The main part is a man named Napoleon owns all of France and is in charge of France. And he basically has conquered a large portion of Europe with the armies of France at this time in 1801 and starts forcing countries in Europe to do what he wants or basically tells them he's going to use his army to force that ha to happen anyway and kill a bunch of their citizens and their armies. And so he ends up actually forcing the king of Fr Spain at this time to give Louisiana to France. And so all of Spanish Louisiana, which is of course including New Orleans and all the way up, um, up to here, which includes part of Canada actually up here, uh, uh, is all given from Spain to Louisiana. Okay, by the King of Spain, because he really has no choice. And so this secret treaty, the Treaty of Ildefonso, is what actually establishes that on paper. Okay, with like a paper contract of that giving to uh, Louisiana to France. So when Americans, the American government goes to ask Spain to basically renew the rights of trading along the Mississippi River and using the port of New Orleans to, you know, go out into the... Uh, Gulf of Mexico, which back then was called the Gulf of Spain, uh, we end up having the Spanish government tell them, well, you really need to talk to to uh, the French government about that, not us. We don't own it anymore. And so we end up actually deciding, okay, well, that's going to be a bit awkward um, because of a couple reasons. One of the main reasons is, at this point, France is heavily interfering with American trade through New Orleans. 
okay? Um, when we end up finding out, that we keep on finding out, oh, there's problems with trading down there, and we didn't understand why. Well, it's all of a sudden because the French government is in charge of New Orleans. And so whenever we try to trade in and out of the city of New Orleans, up the river or out the river, um, down into the Gulf, uh, the, the government and the officials in New Orleans are like, no, you can't do that. And we were always under the assumption, okay, well, we can just, you know, renew that deal with Spain. Well, we can't because it's now France in charge. And also things are a bit awkward with that because remember I talked about the XYZ affair last time on Thursday in class and that kind of started this quasi war between France and America on the seas, okay, between our ships. And that was because French ships were actually interfering with American shipping in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, they would also end up attacking our ships and they would end up uh, kidnapping our sailors um, and putting them in their navy, which was a, a, a term called impressment. We actually talked about that before in the XYZ affair, as well as um, another treaty with Britain that we asked them to stop doing that with us as well. And so this impressment is becoming an issue. Um, and so because of it, we decided to defend our ships and we put Marines on our vessels and started fighting against the French ships whenever they started coming towards us. And so we do kind of have this almost war with France at this time. And so America is kind of in a big predicament like, oh, now we have to deal with, you know, with France as opposed to Spain to use New Orleans and the Mississippi River. This is going to cause issues. And at this point, America was getting scared of Napoleon. Um, Napoleon, of course, is that Emperor of France I just spoke about, and we are actually beginning, or the American government actually is worried that he might actually try to invade America itself through New Orleans, okay, that he would actually sail his armies from Europe, um, end up, like, making port in New Orleans with his troops and either getting on smaller boats or just, you know, kind of coming out of uh, New Orleans up like this and invading here, or end up sailing along the Mississippi River and attacking states like, or territories along here from areas on the Mississippi River. And so it's kind of that fear, because at this point, he's almost conquered almost all of Europe. Um, almost every single country in Europe has surrendered to him or been defeated by him at this point. Um, about the only ones left are kind of Russia and Britain. Um, and, you know, all of, I mean, all the rest of them are all kind of like in, under, under Napoleon's control. So he's not just Emperor of France, he's Emperor of most of Europe at this point. And so if he can do that to the countries of Europe and their big armies, what could he do to America's army and stuff, which at this time we didn't really have a very large army. We were relaying, relying on the state militias for the most part. And so we kind of, um, uh, are kind of worried about that. And so we end up deciding to send two very experienced people to go and talk to Napoleon, or at least his, you know, his ambassador, his ministers, you know, his, uh, his version of the cabinet, um, about, and his governmental workers for him about, you know, what we can do to kind of maybe end this war, but mostly, um, you know, discuss it with, you know, some kind of trade agreement for, you know, New Orleans. And so we end up actually sending James Monroe, who would eventually become a president later on. We'll talk about that in a, uh, the next class period, actually, um, give or take. And um, we'll also, and he at this time, though, James Monroe, he wasn't president yet. Um, uh, Thomas Jefferson is. And at this time, James Monroe is actually the minister or ambassador to Great Britain. Okay, he actually deals in you know, discusses things with Great Britain's government for, on behalf of the United States. And since he's in Britain, and Robert Livingston, who is our ambassador or minister back then, they were really called, um, is the ambassador to France. Um, and Robert Livingston is living in France at this time. And basically, James Monroe kind of shows up with letters telling Robert Livingston, okay, we're supposed to go speak to the French ministers of foreign affairs, Charles Talleyrand and Francois Barbet Marbois. Okay, Francois Barbet Marbois. Yeah, it's a bit of an odd name. And then Charles Talleyrand, we spoke before about um, during the XYZ affair. If you remember, he was the person that we wanted to talk to about with our government officials in that uh, deal. But instead, he decided he wasn't going to meet with us. He sent other people. But since we have kind of come to France 
with this kind of offer about wanting to buy New Orleans and using the Mississippi River from France, um, they're kind of actually willing to speak to us, you know, right away, as opposed to sending, you know, people like X, Y, and Z to speak with us. And so Charles Talleyrand and Francois Barbet Marbois actually meet with James Monroe and Robert Livingston. And right when we basically sit down at the table, both, uh, both pairs of people, um, the Americans say, we want to buy New Orleans straight up. We want to own the entire city. And if we own the city, then we want um, control of the Mississippi River without having to do any other deals. Okay, so we want New Orleans, and we want to be able to use the Mississippi for free. And we will willingly pay you $10 million for the city and for permanent use of that river. And uh, Talleyrand and Marbois, or Barbet Marbois, are not actually allowed to make that decision on their own. Um, Talleyrand himself is actually kind of hesitant about doing this. Um, he kind of feels that we could, you know, that America should maybe pay some more money, um, or even um, kind of wants to keep it because he knows Napoleon wants to keep it. And so Talleyrand and uh, Barbet Marbois go to um, Emperor Napoleon and start, you know, kind of telling Napoleon, pictured here, about the deal, okay? And so Napoleon Bonaparte the Emperor of France first refuses the deal. He hears about that $10 million offer in 1803 from the Americans, Monroe and Livingston, and he immediately decides, no, I do not want to take that deal. Because at the time, he wants New Orleans to actually retake the island of Haiti, okay, in the Caribbean. Okay, Haiti is down here. It used to be a French um, area. Um, French colony, but actually there was a major slave uprising in Haiti, and they were actually able to win that, the slaves there in Haiti, and overthrow the French government and kick them out. And so um, Napoleon Bonaparte really wants to keep New Orleans just in case as like an extra, as a base in America to an, invade Haiti, okay? And he also kind of is thinking about exactly what America is fearing about, like, having a, an American portion of France, you know, of, or more American colonies or French colonies in America. And so he actually possibly is planning future attacks on America, just like America was fearing. And so at the time, though, he's kind of going broke. Um, the French government has overextended um, and has spent a whole lot of money on these wars to conquer Europe. And then now Russia and Britain are causing more issues. A couple of the other nations in Europe that he hasn't completely conquered um, are kind of like saying, oh, no, we don't want to listen to you anymore. And so he really needs money for these wars in Europe. And so at this time, Napoleon would have a lot of his kind of meetings on day-to-day -day policy with his closest allies and friends, and including his brothers. Um, and in fact, he trusted his brother's um, advice more than anybody else. A lot of the other allies and other council members and stuff of the French government, such as Mar Barbet Marbois and Talleyrand, he really didn't respect all the time. But he did respect his brothers at more, more so than the others. Um, and so... Napoleon ends up deciding, okay, um, has this discussion with his brothers. And it's very interesting where he has this discussion with his brothers. So Napoleon was um, rife with a lot of physical issues um, in his life, um, one of them being gout um, from drinking too much alcohol, um, as well as a few other issues. And then he also have he had hemorrhoids, um, a bad case of hemorrhoids at times. And so he loved to soak in the bath like take very, very long baths and bubble baths, not even just regular baths, but full, filled with bubbles. Um, he was a clean freak as well, um, especially, which was kind of different from back then from a lot of people um, that bath, bathed every few days, you know, um, or once a month or sometimes if they were very poor, um, maybe a, a every couple weeks at most in uh, some cases. But he used, he loved to spend hours upon hours in baths. Um, and, you know, it soothed his 
you know, physical ailments. And so he ended up actually having a discussion with his brothers. They were, of course, in the bathroom with him. And they would just kind of meet in the bathroom on their chairs, and he would be sitting in the bath, um, in his bubble bath. And he gets into a discussion with his brothers, and both of them are explaining the financial issues that France has at this time. And he kind of freaks out and gets angry with them. And um, he kind of actually is reported to splash them with water and actually throws water and bubbles at his brothers, complaining at them for telling him, you know, the real truth that, yes, we should probably take the American deal for this amount of money that they want for New Orleans. And so he ends up actually deciding to sell the Louisiana Territory, including New Orleans, for $15 million. Um... To America. Now, this is different than what the Americans wanted. They wanted $10 million to spend $10 million for New Orleans and the whole river. And Napoleon decides, no, if he can't have New Orleans, there's no point having all the rest of this, because you can't really get to it easily, okay, if you're France. Because remember, this would be French now, as opposed to Spanish, all these areas, okay, on this side of this line. And so... He decides if he's not going to have New Orleans, he doesn't want any of Louisiana at all. And so he says to, the, to Talleyrand and Barbet Marbois, go back to the Americans and tell them if they want New Orleans, they can have it, but only if they up the price to $15 million, but then they get the rest of Louisiana too. And if they don't want that deal, then too bad. They're not getting New Orleans, and they're not getting to use the river. And so... Um, Talleyrand and Barbet Marbois go back to James Monroe and Robert Livingston, and they tell them, this is what Emperor Napoleon says, it's $15 million for all of Louisiana, including New Orleans, which means, of course, with America owning both this side of the Mississippi River, right, as well as this side of the Mississippi River, that means the river is theirs as well, okay? And so... The Americans immediately, the two American guys look at each other and they're like, well, that's $5 million more than we were told by the president we could spend, but I think this is our best choice and it's going to take weeks to tell President Jefferson, yes, we're doing this, um, and get a response back even more weeks to wait for that response. So let's just go ahead and say deal now and we'll, we'll worry about convincing Jefferson of the extra money later. And so that's exactly what they do. They, they, they know that this is a one-time offer. If they refuse, the money is only the cost is only going to go up, if at all, if they're even able to ever buy this. And so James Monroe and Robert Livingston say deal um, to the French government, and America now owns all of Louisiana. Um, and and so Louisiana, of course, is this big giant red portion back then. Okay, it's obviously not even all of the entire state of America, um, Louisiana back then. Um, the area that we actually, for the most part, live in, um, if you live on uh, the North Shore area, um, is of course actually not included in the deal, but all of this is. Um, this was actually part of Florida. And so anything in this red area, including a piece of Canada up here, is all included. And it was $15 million for 530 million acres. 530 million acres. That's a huge amount of land, obviously. Um, which comes out, if you do the mileage or whatever, it's 827,000 square miles. Okay? And it comes out between, roughly, between three to five cents per acre. It's about three and a half to four cents. But, um, maybe a little bit more, depending on the math and how many actual acres, because it's roughly, or how many acres, um, because there's a, a couple extra more you know, or less than 530. It's roughly 530 million acres. And so if you do the math, it comes out as about three and a half to four and a half cents per acre. But really, let's just cut to the chase and say less than five cents per acre, which is ext extraordinary. Um, and it comes out to be, if you do like the divvying up on what pieces are what part for what states. It's part of 15 states and actually two Canadian territories. But 15 American states is, are able to be made in part or whole of the Louisiana Purchase. And as you can see here, you know, a couple of states like Wyoming and Colorado and stuff like that um, and Oklahoma aren't completely uh, taken up by parts of it. You know, Minnesota, etc., and North Dakota. Even South Dakota, part of it isn't included. But if you do the math and numbers and a couple of these other states that are partially like these, um, it's it's 15, give or take, okay? So 15 is the answer um, 
to if you're ever asked that kind of question. Okay, and so Porter Hole of 15 states. Um, interestingly, to end the part about the Louisiana Purchase on this uh, discussion, um, the Louisiana Purchase is kind of you know, come back home as well a little bit to Louisiana itself. Um, it's actually um, the bathtub here, okay, when Napoleon decided with his brothers that he was going to sell it, he was sitting in this actual very own bathtub. This is a picture um, of the bathtub today, um, or at least a couple years ago, because it is actually in Le Pavilion Hotel, which is located in downtown New Orleans. Okay, so right across the lake, and on the seventh floor suite, if you were to rent the room for a night, for a single night stay, it would cost you a thousand dollars today. Um, and so if you wanted to rent the room to go and sit or um, have a bath in Napoleon's very own bathtub, um, or what used to be worth, um, or what used to be Napoleon's very own bathtub, um, and the one that he actually signed the Louisiana Purchase in, um, you could do that. Um, just pay a thousand dollars a day for the single night. Um, and that bathtub is actually itself is worth three hundred and fifty thousand dollars itself. And it was of course owned by Emperor Napoleon. Um, and the emperor, uh, the hotel's general merit manager, um, in a interview actually talked about this marble carved bathtub. It's of course made of stone, right? Marble stone. And so um, if you're ever curious on, you know, seeing where the Louisiana Purchase was actually signed, well, you can actually go to New Orleans's hotel because of course it was sold from France and brought over to America um, kind of later on. Okay, so now on to the second major topic of this lecture video, and that is the Lewis and Clark Expedition. Um, due to the Louisiana Purchase of 1803, a huge amount of land, all of this area, needed to be explored, okay? And now Lewis and Clark wouldn't explore every inch of this, okay? They wouldn't even clo um, uh, explore even the majority of it, but they would explore a fair part of it as well as going elsewhere. And so let's talk a little bit about that expedition. So the Lewis and Clark expedition. Who are Lewis and Clark? Well, they are Meriwether Lewis and William Clark, two men that were both captains in the U.S. Army, so the United States Army, and they were actually the first two um, leaders um, in charge of the Corps of Discovery, which is this group of the U.S. Army um, back then that were, were brand new and created specifically to start... Um, discovering and exploring new territory of the American nation, okay? And in this case, it would be, you know, Louisiana Purchase would be part of it that would, they would be tasked with. Um, Lewis was appointed to be in charge, even though they were the same rank, Lewis was appointed to be really in charge by President Thomas Jefferson specifically, okay? And finally, when the Louisiana Purchase is sold, I mean, is bought, um, it takes a little while, but... Uh, President Thomas Jefferson says to Lewis and Clark that he wants them, um, with Lewis in command of it officially, to go and explore the Louisiana Purchase and try to find a river that cuts from the Mississippi River all the way out to the coast of the Pacific Ocean. Okay, from the Mississippi River out to the Pacific Ocean. Um, again, they're looking for that Northwest Passage. Remember the Northwest Passage, um, which is said back then to have existed. Well, it doesn't, right? And so they're looking for a river or some kind of water route that can cut across all of America. And so on May 14th, 1804, Lewis and Clark, along with 29 other men, okay, plus one dog, the dog is pictured right there. His The dog's name was Seaman, okay, or Seaman, okay, was the name of the dog. Um, and it, this dog was actually Lewis's dog himself, okay? Um, he was 150 pounds. It's a giant dog, okay? It's a really, really big dog. It was a Newfoundland, okay? A, um, a dog breed Newfoundland. Um, maybe some of you have seen them. You can look them up afterwards, but a Newfoundland, Newfoundland breed of dog, and they're giant dogs. Um, um, uh, Lewis actually paid $20 back then, um, in the 1800s, early 1800s, for this dog. And it was his pet dog. Um, and if you actually do the math on the amount of that $20 today, it would cost about $350 today, okay, in 2020 or 2021, um, if you do the math on the inflation and everything. So, kind of an expensive dog. Um, but this dog is actually very famous because on this expedition, they bring very ho several horses and several other animals and stuff with them. 
Um, and while on their expedition, um, all of the animals end up dying except for Seaman. Okay, Seaman is the only one that actually makes it all the way um, on this expedition and all the way back with the uh, with the men of the expedition. Now, Thomas Jefferson, before Meriwether Lewis and William Clark actually leave on this expedition with the other 29 men and seamen, uh, they end up actually bring, um, he, Jefferson gives them a box of these silver coins, okay? Which are basically silver coins, but they're actually silver Indian peace medals, okay? They're called Indian peace medals, and they of course have Thomas Jefferson's bust, engraved on them, meaning his chest, you know, and his head, okay, and part of his, you know, obviously part of his face. And it's to kind of show that who is in charge of America at this time. And the reason why he's doing this is because he realizes that Lewis and Clark are going to meet a lot of different native tribes, okay? And while on this expedition, they're going to need help from these native tribes, and usually giving a gift um, is very important to Native Americans um, to start things off right, um, especially with tribes that you've never met before, you know, out here that have never met anyone from, you know, America or any other European nation, right, um, for the most part. And so the idea is if you give them this, like, silver, you know, peace medal, I mean, which is shiny silver um, and has a picture of the leader of, you know, the American tribe, right? The Nate and the American, you know, their version of the tribe, which would be the the president, right? The chief of America would be the president, and so it would be kind of the uh, Native Americans kind of understanding. Oh, your tribe's leader is Thomas Jefferson, the guy on the picture, right? And our chief is this guy, you know, kind of idea. Um, and so that went uh, was kind of a very. Um, uh, important thing to bring with them so they could show who was their leader as well as, you know, you know, kind of a gift to get the natives on their side, as well as Jefferson kind of being a bit conceited by putting himself on the picture. Um, but, you know, of course, that made sense because it would be like, well, who's your leader? Are you the, or is Lewis and Clark the leader? And the answer would be like, no, no, we, we answer to someone else. Um, they decide on May 14th, 1804 to leave from a small town called St. Charles, Missouri, which is very close to St. Louis, Missouri, okay, um, right on the river. Um, it's very nearby St. Louis, but it's a, a few miles away, okay, so St. Charles is when they where they officially leave from, and they start immediately moving up from the Mississippi River and Missouri River up the Missouri River up this direction, all 31 of them plus the dog and a few horses and uh, mules and things as well, and some small boats. Um, while on the trip, actually, one of the people that goes with them, included in 31, is this man right here, um, York. He is actually Captain William Clark's personal slave, um, and he participated in the entire expedition, um, and... Uh, you know, he kind of didn't really have a choice at first whether he'd go or not, you know, because William Clark was bringing him with him, but, um, York actually was a valued member of the expedition, and if you actually read any documents or read any, or listen to any documentaries or anything, or watch any documentaries or podcasts or anything on this, um, on the Lewis and Clark expedition, he is typically mentioned. And uh, if you read any of the journals and stuff from William Clark and uh, Meriwether Lewis, um, whenever the group of 31 of them would end up deciding to vote on what kind of course of action they would do if they couldn't come up with a correct idea, if, you know, William and uh, with William Clark and Meriwether Lewis couldn't decide on something, they would end up holding a vote for everybody to decide, especially on special circumstances, you know, um, or particularly dangerous, you know, tasks or options, right? Um, and York had a vote equal to anybody else in this. He was one of them. They all felt that he was just as um, worthy as having a voice in the decisions because it was going to affect him just as much as anybody else. Um, uh, William Clark, uh, oh, sorry, York was actually one of the very few people on the expedition who could swim, which is also um, pointed out in the journals and stuff as well, which is kind of interesting. At one point, um, one of the boats um, tips over, and he is able to actually help some of the other people that couldn't swim um, on one of the little rafting trips and stuff they're doing. Um, he is also able to swim from, like, one side of the river to another side um, when they all needed something from that side of the river, and most of them were like, well, I can't swim, and so he was able to do that. 
Um, he was also very skilled in hunting with a rifle, um, and given a weapon, you know, to defend himself and go hunting. Um, and then he also helped on scouting trips and trading with Native Americans. And in fact, it turns out that the Native Americans actually really liked him. Um, whether it was because maybe he was, you know, different looking or just a somehow appealed to them on a different way or was able to interact with them better um, in person. Um, it's actually talked about in the journals that um, the children of the Native Americans would actually kind of follow him around while all the other, you know, uh, members of the expedition were kind of doing the deal with, um, you know, with the chiefs or in the adults of the native tribes that they interacted with, um, York and several of the other men would do something else. And the children of the native tribes would typically just kind of like follow and watch York, what, what he was doing out of curiosity. Um, and so maybe that had to do with, um, either his, uh, ethnicity or maybe it was just his, his manner with, you know, native Americans somehow. Maybe he was gifted at you know, communicating with them somehow. Um, and so, of course, there is actually a statue of York in Louisville, Kentucky, and actually at Fort Mandan, um, which we'll talk about in a minute, there's a statue of him right there next to the dog seaman. And then we've got um, uh, Lewis, Clark, and then Sacagawea. And we'll talk about Sacagawea in just a moment. And so where else did um, uh, this expedition go? So obviously they went up from St. Charles all the way up the Missouri, Missouri River and started going up to an area right here called Fort Mandan which they ended up um, creating. But on the way to Fort Mandan, um, which they built, um, we ended up actually having the one death on the entire trip. There was only one person to die on this entire trip, and that was a man by the name of Sergeant Charles Floyd, okay, from the U.S. Army. Charles Floyd, he was a sergeant in the U.S. Army, and he died from an appendicitis, meaning his appendix burst. Um, you know, and I don't know how many of you have had that issue before, or relatives or friends. I can tell you from my own past experience, it's absolutely horrible. I felt like I was dying for like three days um, before they ended up actually cutting it out of me um, uh, on in surgery. And so and the appendix, you know, a lot of uselessness on what it does in our bodies now. It used to do a lot more um, when we were, you know, uh, <laughs> thousands of years ago. Um, but now it's not really needed. Um, but, you know, if they end up having a problem where it gets infected or whatever, it can burst and it can kill you um, if it bursts. Um, in your body. And so um, Charles Floyd ended up actually dying from an appendicitis, um, and they buried him at uh, Sioux City, um, or where Sioux City is today. Um, he is the only person to have died on the trip. Um, and eventually they make a, a bit further north, and they build um, Fort Mandan on the banks of the Missouri River, and they end up actually spending the winter there, their first winter on the trip there because they've explored all the way from May all the way up to here. Now it's winter, um, and they've decided, okay, well, it's a bit too cold to continue on. And while they were there, they end up actually meeting a young woman um, who was about 15 years old at the time um, named Sacagawea, okay? She was um, um, a native daughter of the chief of the Shoshone tribe, okay? She was the daughter of the chief of the Shoshone tribe, or Shoshone tribe, and she was actually at 15 back then, and which was relatively common for 15-year-olds to be married back then, which is kind of astonishing um, for to, today, to compare to today's standards, right? Um, she was actually the wife of Toussaint Charbonneau. Um, that is that man right there. Uh, Toussaint Charbonneau um, actually... Ha, uh, was a hunter and French Canadian, meaning that he was from France originally, um, or had French, you know, heritage and was part of, um, Canada, um, uh, Canadian families as well. And eventually, um, over time, you know, of course, you know, Britain owns, uh, Canada. So, but he was French, um, on his bank background, obviously from his name. And he was a fur trapper. And he actually went to the chief of the Shoshone's tribe and he bought, um, the 15-year-old daughter of the chief um, for about $500, okay? Um, that was kind of a common thing, was to buy brides and buy um, a, a potential wife. And he actually ended up buying Sacagawea to have as his wife from the Shoshone tribe, okay? Um, and the two of them together ended up meeting Lewis and Clark's expedition at Fort Mandan that that winter, um, and Lewis and Clark immediately realized that Sacagawea, being a Native American, 
um, was actually able to possibly communicate to other tribes. She spoke multiple different languages um, and or was able to understand multiple different Native American languages because they weren't always that different from each other. Um, there was kind of some kind of ideas um, behind them. And so she actually was very valuable as the expedition's interpreter. Sacagawea, even though she was only 15 to about 17 um, at the time, okay, because, you know, she, they would be gone for a couple years, um, they, uh, she was very valued in, the, in there, and that is why she is pictured right there. And she's actually pictured with her infant son in the image. Um, she would end up actually giving, be, be giving birth on the trip as well. Um, now, interesting fact about Toussaint Charbonneau before we move on is he was actually very famous um, for making bison or buffalo boudin. So basically, uh, boudin, kind of like sausage that we have here, um, very similar anyway. Um, but he was famous for making boudin out of bison and buffalo um, on the trip um, for the other members to eat, as well as himself, right? Um, but uh, that was really one of his big valued uh Contrib contributions to the trip, as well as being able to hunt as well for food for the rest of them. Uh, moving on, they eventually keep going all the way from Fort Mandan down several rivers, trying to find one river that connects the Missouri River, and then they would con uh, get all go on to another river, and then eventually out oh, all the way to here to the coast. So. Um, they're looking for that Northwest Passage, right? Um, eventually, they decide once they get to the coast, they actually in present-day Oregon. Um, which was relatively un, um, undiscovered or anything or unexplored other than by a few Russians and then a few Spanish um, coming from the south. Um, and they established a fort and built a fort called Fort Clatsop. And that is in present-day Oregon, right on the coast. And then finally, after spending a little while there, on March 23rd, 1806, they end up actually finally heading back this direction, up and down a couple more rivers, still looking for where some of these rivers would link up all the way to the Missouri River and then to the Mississippi River, but obviously none of them do. And then finally, by the time they make it all the way back to almost where they started, they actually make it all the way back to Missouri. They actually reach St. Louis, Missouri, um, which wasn't too far from where they started at St. Charles, um, on September 23rd, 1806. It, this entire trip from when they left to get there and all the way back took 28 months. 28 months, so over two years of time, and they traveled about 8,000 miles total. Now, America, if you measured it from coast to coast, okay, from furthest tip to furthest tip, it's actually only 3,000 miles wide, okay? So why is it 8,000 miles? Well, they didn't go directly one way, right? Um, and they went up, and then this way, and then they went this way, and then back down. Um, so if you do all that, it comes out at about 8,000 about 8,000 miles. Um, and they made a couple side trips, which aren't kind of shown on this area, you know, on, on some of these little areas. Um, they did fail to find that Northwest Passage or that navigable water route all the way to the West Coast. You know, America's really hoping, as well as previous governments beforehand when they were colonizing the Americas, um, they were hoping for one river that would go all the way across. Well, it just doesn't exist. So they failed to do that. Um, but they did... Um, make many treaties with those um, uh, with those Indian peace medals as well as you know other gifts and trades and stuff like that they they were able to contact a lot of different tribes um, they were able to find many natural resources and explore a whole lot of territory okay um, and so while the big thing that they were tasked with doing is was a failure they really succeeded in the rest. You know, they succeeded everywhere else. Um, and so here's a couple pictures that are interesting, um, f which were actually photographed by my family and I up in um, uh, Montana. There's actually a museum up there. Um, and so there's a page of Clark's sketchbook. Um, while they were gone, William Clark and us, of course, Meriwether Lewis would constantly write journals and write about what's going on on the trip, you know, for historical record, um, as well as just, you know, anything else they might need to do. Um, but William Clark would also draw a lot um, on these sketches, as I mean, sketch in his, um, in his things as well, in his uh, journal as well. And so this is a page of Clark's um, 
uh, sketchbook where it's a big fish that they probably obviously caught, um, which was maybe a bit different than other fish that he had caught in the past elsewhere in America. And then he also has a map here, which even has the latitude and longitude, because they were, of course, mapping where they were. Okay, and latitude and longitude are those imaginary lines that go up and down the side of the globe or on maps. Um, and of course, you know, you've got the river and you've got these like rocks and stuff maybe on there, or maybe that's showing which the how big the waves were in that area, if it's a, you know, a rapids or whatever like that. And then there's hills and stuff like that. There's a couple notes on the sides. And so that's just kind of interesting um, that you could, uh, I wanted to sh show you these um, to kind of see these kind of sketches that they would be taking that other explorers, when they did their exploration of various areas, would also do the same. And then, of course, we've also got a statue of Sacagawea herself with her son right there in Montana riding a horse. Okay? And so, you know, she is well known um, uh, relatively in American history because of this expedition. She also, I believe, actually was on um, some currency. Um, on a coin or something um, for America for a while. Um, and then a lot of people have talked about having her maybe um, on the $20 bill or the $10 bill or something like when it's maybe reprinted in a few years or kind of idea or maybe another dollar uh, bill amount. Um, so now so let's head to our third major topic of this lecture video. And that is, of course, who shot Alexander Hamilton? Well, here's Alexander Hamilton, and it's no shock on who actually shot him. There's no mystery about it at all. It's actually Aaron Burr. Aaron Burr is the person that shot him, and that is, he is pictured right there. But why did he shoot him is really the real question. And so um, we've got a picture of Alexander Hamilton, and we've got a statue of Aaron Burr. And how did they become rivals? Why did this all start? And it's a kind of long story, which I told you um, a few lectures ago in class when we talked about Valley Forge and the War of Independence, or American Revolution, um, with George Washington's staff. Both of them worked on George Washington's staff at Valley Valley Forge, as well as throughout the entire War of Independence. Both of them were constantly competing for approval from George Washington. They knew how important George Washington was, and they really, really wanted some sort of, you know, thanks from him constantly. Um, and whenever one of them would be thanked, the other one would kind of rub it in to the other. Um, and it was at first like a small friendly rivalry, and it quickly developed so that it wasn't soon after. Um, after the war ended and America got its independence, both of them invested their money into different competing banks. They ended up buying stock, okay, just like if you want to play the stock market today, um, uh, if you have money to invest, you could do that. And they invested into two competing banks. Alexander Hamilton invested into the Bank of New York in New York City. And Aaron Burr invested into the Bank of Manhattan, also in New York City. And so these two banks were actually rival banks. And so when one of them would end up getting, you know, better um, stock-wise or stock dividends or whatever, or make new deals or whatever, um, or go up in, uh, in amounts and stuff, then the other one would get jealous. And so they're not just rivals, you know, competing for approval from Washington anymore after the war, because that's no longer going to be a thing. They're now competing financially against each other. Both of them also start um, becoming part of the opposing political parties that start forming right when this country is formed. And of course, Alexander F Hamilton becomes a member of the Federalist Party. He also writes the Federalist Papers, you know, supporting um, the constant new constitution. Aaron Burr doesn't not support, you know, the the Constitution. He does support it. He just has some critiques of parts of it and critiques of the American government as it begins. Um, and then starts saying, okay, you know, we can use the Constitution for such and such things and stuff like that. And he joins the Democratic Republican Party, okay, um, which of course are the two first uh, political parties, the Federalist Party and the Democratic Republican Party. And we've mentioned that before in class. Now, they're obviously members of opposing political parties, and because of that, that is going to cause a lot of issues and friction between the two of them when both of them are competing for, you know, their political party to become stronger and more powerful than the other one um, in elections. And the first real election that that's going to crop, pop up in is during the 1791 election, and it's the U.S. Senate election that year, okay? There's no presidential election that year, just a U.S. Senate election. And Aaron Burr decides that he wants to run for the state, um, for the seat in New York, 
okay? He wants to become um, this senator of New York, okay? Now, Aaron Burr is a Democratic Republican, and he's running for the seat. However, there was a prior senator in that spot already, and his name was Philip, Philip Schuyler, okay? It looks like Schuyler, um, but it's pronounced Schuyler. Um, Philip Schuyler is the incumbent, meaning that he already is that senator, and he wants to run again. Okay, which he's allowed to, right? And so Philip Schuyler is running it for that same Senate spot again, but Aaron Burr decides, well, even though that guy's on the same political party as me, I want to run against him. I think I can do the be job better. And Schuyler is actually Alexander Hamilton's father-in-law. Alexander Hamilton married Philip Schuyler's daughter, okay? And so while Philip Schuyler is a Democratic Republican and Alexander Hamilton is a Federalist, Hamilton really relies on Schuyler's bipartisan support, you know, because they're friends, you know, and father and son-in-law. Um, whenever Hamilton, as Secretary of Treasury, remember he was the Secretary of Treasury, Ham Hamilton, um, whenever he wanted something to get passed in the Senate, he would go to Schuyler and talk to Schuyler like, hey, what do you think about this idea that I've got? I know I'm a Federalist, and, you know, our political ideas d differ, but can I count on your support, you know, you know, as my father-in-law to talk to some of your other buddies in the Democratic Republicans in the Senate to get this passed. And Schuyler would look at the whatever idea Hamilton was going proposing, and usually he would back it, no matter what. Um, you know, there were a couple times he didn't, but for the most part, he would. And because it was a Democratic-Republican voting, and the Federalists would vote alongside Hamilton in the Senate, or the Federalist senators would, um, and when you end up having that Democratic Republican from the other side jump across party lines to vote on something. Some of the other Democratic Republicans that would maybe just vote against it because it's, oh, it's not from our side, they end up looking at it as well. And so things would end up getting passed by the Treasury Department that Alexander Hamilton wanted because of this. Well, Schuyler loses this election to Aaron Burr. And so that help in the tre that the Treasury Department would need to get things passed under Hamilton it, by the Senate vote is it not going to happen anymore because Aaron Burr is going to be opposing everything that Hamilton comes up with because the two of them hate each other at this point. They're really, really beginning to hate each other. Um, they've been rivals and it was first friendly rivalry. It's not so friendly anymore. And so when Philip Schuyler loses that election and Aaron Burr becomes the pre um, new senator of New York or one of the two senators of New York, right? Um, and Philip Schuyler is no longer one of them. Um, it really is going to hurt Hamilton politically, okay? And in 1800, Hamilton, as Secretary of the Treasury, is still Secretary of the Treasury when George Washington steps down. And he ends up actually going under, as Secretary of the Treasury, under President John Adams for a while. And he doesn't necessarily like John Adams, okay? Hamilton. And so in the year 1800, um, Hamilton, while a Secretary of Treasury, actually writes a private criticism, like a letter, talking about, talking bad stuff about John Adams' policies, okay? And, um, he kind of wants to give that to one of his friends, one of Hamilton's friends, is what the idea is. He was just going to give it to him, and no one else would see it. Um, however, Aaron Burr ends up getting a hold of that letter, and actually makes it public, and prints it in a newspaper, I believe, and hands it out to a bunch of other Federalists, as well as Democratic Republicans. And when you've got one Federalist party member knocking the president, um, it kind of looks really bad politically. And because of that, it really embarrasses Hamilton, and he's absolutely becomes livid and furious with Burr. Um, and that's going to matter in the 1800 election, which we'll get to in a second. But it really upsets Hamilton that Burr did this. You know, that was taking things a bit too far. Burr just keeps on doing things to irk Hamilton, and vice versa. Um, this also letter actually kind of begins to degrade and split the Federalist Party, um, on a side note, um, which is kind of interesting. Like, a lot of other people in the Federalist Party had the same ideas about John Adams, and when they hear about it, they're like, yeah, Hamilton's right, but he shouldn't have said that, <laughs> is the kind of the idea. And that's why it's embarrassing for Hamilton. Um, 
the 1800 presidential election, um, we talked about this last lecture where um, Burr was a candidate in this election and he and Jefferson both tie for electoral college votes and the Ham um, House of Representatives has to make the tie-breaking decision and after 35 votes they finally um, cannot come up with who to put in and Hamilton finds out about the deadlock in the House of Representatives and so he writes a letter um, to a bunch of his friends in the fe that are met Federalists in the House of Representatives to sway their vote and he also even makes a speech to the House of Representatives or at least outside the main room to a couple friends of his that are Federalists and when he you know is talking about this I said in class that he basically calls Alexander Hamilton a bunch of bad words which he kind of does um, and he says like you know we really don't want um, Aaron Burr is in charge you know, we cannot have Burr as president. Jefferson, he might not be um, a Federalist like the rest of us are, you know. He, yes, he's a Democratic-Republican just like Burr, but, you know, he's better than Burr. Um, and so he really knocks down Burr with a bunch of um, horrible remarks about Burr in these speeches and these letters. And the House of Representative Federalist members end up deciding to change their vote to be against Burr as opposed to being tied. And so Jefferson wins the presidency. And that even makes Burr even more angry at Hamilton. You know, first it's Hamilton getting angrier and angrier at Burr. And now it's Burr is angry at Hamilton as well. You know, it just keeps on going back and forth between the two of them. And that's when Burr decides a few years later, four years later, at, while he is vice president. Because remember, Burr becomes vice president to Thomas Jefferson. Well, Burr, while Burr is vice president, he decides, I don't want to be vice president again. Because Jefferson's probably a shoe-in for re-election. I don't want to be vice president again. I want to be governor of New York State. And so he decides to run for New York State um, as the governor. And while as, um campaigning he ends up you know making it public that he's campaigning for governor while still as vice president you know he's you know in one political job but you know he would take his weekends and even some days during the week to travel to new york and make you know press conferences basically and go places trying to run for you know office um and so while he starts doing that hamilton finds out and hamilton is like oh no i do not want burr to become governor of new york no cannot let this happen um, and so he ends up actually, Hamilton actually campaigns for uh, Burr's opponent against Burr. Um, and it's actually the Attorney General of New York at the state at the time, Morgan Lewis, is running for governor against Burr. And Morgan Lewis actually wins that election. And Burr is really, really upset and salty after the fact. Um, and so it's kind of now like Alexander Hamilton is now cost burr two elections in a row you know in a four-year period two elections a governor spot and presidency um both lost because of hamilton and hamilton's donations and stuff and hamilton talking to people about burr and um on behalf of morgan lewis and so burr is really pissed at this point well, eventually, a dinner party happens, okay, a big, nice, posh dinner party with a bunch of politicians, and Alexander Hamilton is at it. Aaron Burr is not, but several of Burr's friends are. And during, like, when they're all talking, you know, at dinner and stuff, um, Hamilton actually criticizes Burr at this dinner party, and one of the guests at the party, who is a friend of Burr's, actually writes a letter quoting Hamilton multiple times, and he publishes it in newspapers. And this newspaper, you know, comment section of all of what Hamilton is saying, you know, slamming and making fun of Aaron Burr, gets out publicly because it's in the newspapers, and Burr is pissed. Burr is absolutely angry, angrier than he's ever been with Hamilton. And back then, if you were angry, you could challenge someone to a duel. Okay, like fighting each other to the death or shooting at each other once each. Okay, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And that's exactly what Burr decides to do. He decides that, you know what, I'm, I'm tired of just trying to one-up Alexander Hamilton and beat him in elections. I'm trying to, I'm, I'm angry at him for all these different reasons at this point. I cannot see anything different. I'm just going to try to kill the man. Um, and so Burr challenges Hamilton to a duel. And Hamilton is able to just say, no, I don't want to duel you, okay? It's like just when someone says, I, do you want to fight? Hamilton can just say, say no. But Hamilton decides, no, 
you know, it's an honorable thing back then to accept a person's challenge to a duel. And so that's exactly what's going to end up happening. Okay, so back then, dueling was still very fairly common, even though it is illegal. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, it is illegal, but dueling was very fairly common as a way of defending one's honor or reputation. Okay, and so as a recap, Alexander Hamilton is Federalist. And he is got heavy influence and stock into the Bank of New York. Aaron Burr is a Democratic Republican, and he has heavy stock into the Bank of Manhattan. And of course, their portraits. And we have two dueling pistols, as they would be shown back then. These are actually very similar to the pistols that they were used. They would use. And so, what is dueling? Well, it's kind of like this, but without the crowd. Okay. And what they would do is they would. Um, go to a place that was specifically for dueling, and in this case, on July 11th, they would do this, on July 11th, 1804, at Weehawken, New Jersey, and there were some dueling grounds at Weehawken. Um, in fact, it's this kind of tiny little island um, right um, in this giant lake right near Weehawken, okay, the town of Weehawken. Um, and what they would end up doing is both of them would um, have, like, one extra person with them, their, like, best friend or what they would call their second as, like, a witness. And there would usually be a doctor and a judge. Not, like, a political, like, a judge of a courtroom, but, like, someone to say, oh, now you can fire. Okay? And what they would do is they would actually stand back to back, you know, um, and then they would start walking away from each other, each other certain number of paces, usually ten away. So it would be about twenty paces apart, which would be about sixty feet. Okay, you know, because each pace is about two to three feet. Okay, um, so 40 to 60 feet away, um, about 20 steps away from each other. And they would turn around and then the judge would say, okay, turn around towards each other. And they would aim at each other and they would fire. And usually it was allowed that one person would get to fire the first shot. Um, sometimes they would just kind of wait till the other person fired. It didn't really matter. Um, usually they would fire at the same time and stuff. The two of them are given pistols that are... 0.56 caliber Wogden dueling pistols, which were special pistols better than the normal ones of the time. Remember, the pistols and guns back then were very inaccurate, okay? Um, which sometimes they often misfired and broke, like they would end up exploding the person's hand if they were in reloaded incorrectly and stuff. But these ones were like really special, like best of the best made pistols. Um, specifically, um, able to be very accurate at hitting the enemy target. They had the rifling, okay, to make that perfect spin on the ball kind of idea. Um, they were given to them for the duel by John Barker Church, which happened to be Hamilton's brother-in-law, okay, his brother-in-law. And so, um, and they're of .56 caliber, meaning is that it's slightly over an inch wide of a bullet, okay, or half an inch wide, okay, half an inch wide. So slightly over half an inch wide bullet, which is a pretty big bullet um, going, you know, really fast at you. Um, and so Hamilton ends up actually firing first at Burr um, on this very early morning of July 11th, but he actually likely missed on purpose. Um, a lot of people say that he actually aimed at Burr and then he raised his hand slightly elevated so that he would be firing over Burr's head, like basically firing up into a tree. And he ends up actually hitting a tree branch. Um, with his bullet. And it's probably that he likely missed on purpose, because he doesn't really want to kill Burr. He probably just wanted to take this duel as, okay, Burr's so pissed at me, the only way he's not going to be pissed at me is if I end up accepting this challenge. Um, because both of us keep on insulting each other and doing things to each other. My honor, honor and reputation is tarnished. His is as well. He wants to get it out of his system. Let's just go through with this. Neither of us are going to end up dying. You know? Um, however, Hamilton fires first on purpose, likely missed on purpose, didn't want to kill Burr probably, um, unless he's a really horrible shot and doesn't know how the bullet would fly, but that's not true. He was in the military, both of them were. So we can assume that Burr, he missed, I mean, Hamilton missed on purpose. Now Burr, right when Hamilton has fired, he's not going to be able to reload. It's only one shot per person on this duel. And so Burr aims at Hamilton and fires immediately at Hamilton, um, directly at him, and actually hits him in the stomach. Um, hits um, Alexander Hamilton in the stomach, um, and it actually gets lodged in his stomach, and they're not really able to get it out easily. I think they might have been able to get it out finally, um, but by then he was he was horribly 
you know, sick um, and injured from the injury. Um, and uh, Hamilton actually dies on July 12th, 1804, the next day. Okay, so um, they fought on the morning of the 11th, and he dies the next day. And this is a kind of image where each of them would have had a backup, and then one of them in the middle saying, hey, yes, you can fire um, the witness um, for their backup. And then Aaron Burr is charged with murder, okay, because back then, even though dueling is common, it is still illegal, okay? It is illegal, um, because what you are doing is committing murder, or at least very, at the very least, shooting someone, right, and injuring them, and in shooting someone usually ended up killing them, right, because of, you know, infection back then, um, and so Burr is charged with murder, however, he is not prosecuted, meaning he's not put on trial right away, because at this time, he's still technically vice president, because they haven't yet had the election, and he, you know, um, for, you know, or they have, but he's just not, you know, ushered into it yet. He would be no longer vice president in 1805. Um, in March 1805, when Burr finally leaves the political office of vice president, when another vice president becomes vice president, um, he actually fled the country. And he ends up actually fleeing the country for 30 years all the way to um, Europe. He ends up going all the way to Europe because of this. Um, he realizes that if he were to stay in America, he could be charged, you know, with murder for murdering Hamilton, um, which obviously he did, right? There's witnesses for it. And so um, he is he actually flees the country, goes to Europe, stays in France for a little while, then goes to Britain for a little while um, before finally coming back. And by the time he finally came back, um, the charges had been dropped, not really because he had outlasted murder, um, because murder is one that doesn't really go away law-wise, um, but really mostly because anyone that was going to prosecute him really had kind of forgotten about it or just decided not to push charges anymore. Um, however, he never holds another political office ever again in American politics. Vice president is his last one. Um, and of course, Alexander Hamilton is, of course, dead, right, in 1804. So, um, uh, there is actually a plaque at Weehawken Dueling Grounds. Um, there are actually multiple um, uh, famous people that fought there. Um, Oliver Hazard Perry, which I'll talk about during the... Um, uh, War of 1812, um, and then DeWitt Clinton, he runs for political office multiple times for presidency and stuff. We'll talk about him, mention him. He's actually governor of New York. So the Weehawken Dueling Grounds was actually very famous, this little tiny island that you would take like a rowboat out to it in the early morning, like right after dawn is when they usually did it. Um, and so it was a very uh, famous area, even though it is illegal to do dueling at the time. Now, lastly, um, who sh um, on this, you know, kind of part of this lecture, um, the pistols today um, are actually, if you want, want to go see them and you're actually ever on 277 Park Avenue in New York City, you can go to the J.P. Morgan Chase Bank. Yes, Chase Bank. You know, there's Chase Banks all around here or J.P. Morgan Chase Bank. It's a banking you know, um, uh, one throughout the whole country, really. Um, J.P. Morgan Chase's bank in New York City, the main branch, actually has the pistols on display in the main lobby area, or a side lobby area, I'm not sure which now. Um, but uh, you can actually go visit them. These are the actual two pistols that were, the Wogden pistols that were used to shoot from Burr to uh, um, into the tree branch, and then Ale or from Alexander Hamilton into the tree branch, and then Burr into Hamilton. Um, uh, interestingly, the J.P. Morgan Chase Bank, if you do the history on that banking, um, you know, banking institution, you can trace them all the way back to the Bank of Manhattan, which is actually the bank that Burr backed. Um, politically, or not really politically, um, financially, right? He had stock in that company. So it's kind of interesting that um, it's actually Burr's Bank is where the two of them are actually located today. Um, kind of kind of cool that they've stayed, you know, within the, you know, historically between the two of them. Um, lastly, before I go on to the last slide, um, I do want to tell a little story because I find this actually very um, funny and students always remember this one. Um, there was a commercial back when I was a kid or a teenager that I still remember and it's always this um, kind of like it shows it as a museum and it is in a museum is where the commercial is kind of filmed and it's this man who's like a history professor or historian and he's going through all these papers and there's pictures of Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr. There's actually one of 
the pistols are even supposed to be there and the bullet is there, even though this is all fake, right? Because it's a commercial. Um, there's books upon books on the, on Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr and the radio is playing in the background and it says, for the $1 million question or $100,000 question, who shot Alexander Hamilton? And at the time when he was listening to it, the, the person in charge of the museum, the historian, the man in the commercial, hears that commercial and he's just made a peanut butter sandwich. And he's just taken a bite of the peanut butter sandwich. And as he's munching on the peanut butter sandwich, he hears the, the amount for the money. And he's like, oh my God, I want to win this, you know, is what he's thinking. And so he calls up the, um, calls up the number, um, to the radio, uh, radio show. And they're like, hi, yes, you're the correct caller. Who's the, who's the band that shot Alexander Hamilton? And he's got this, you know, peanut butter bread mixture in his mouth and he can't really say Aaron Burr. And he tries to and it comes out as Aaron Burr, Aaron Burr. And he's trying to like say it oh, repeatedly. Um, and at that point he's trying to like grab the milk jug to pour some milk to be able to clear the, all the peanut butter and bread from his mouth. And he can't because it's, he's out of milk. Um, and it's, it's funny because the radio show host kind of hangs up on him because he can't understand him. Well, the whole commercial is back when, back in the day, it's a got milk commercial for, to sell milk. Um, which was kind of funny. Um, if, you know, he's got this mouthful of peanut butter, he couldn't get that drink of milk. And so he misses out on the, you know, hundred thousand dollars or million dollars or whatever prize. I just think it's kind of funny because it's always one of those things that even before I was loving history as much as I do now, I still remember that commercial. I still remember him saying Aaron Burr. And I still always will re probably remember it because of that commercial, liter if, even if not from any other readings of books and stuff that I've done on the topics, on the topic. Um, so next time for Thursday's class, we'll end up covering uh, multiple presidential elections, 1804, 1808, and 1812, um, where, and polling back then, uh, not very different from voting back today, right? Um, we're also going to cover round one of a conflict between William Henry Harrison and Tecumseh. Um, he's a Native American um, uh, tribe chief, and his brother as well are going to show down against William Henry Harrison, a governor of one of the territories out west. Um, we're also going to cover the 1811 slave revolt, which which is actually the largest ever slave revolt in American history, in or at least our country of America's history, um, as opposed to like Haiti or something like that, like I mentioned in this video. And then we're also going to begin discussing a man named Henry Clay. Henry Clay is pictured right here when he started politics, when he was young and first voted into the House of Representatives and as a senator later on as well. Um, and eventually he would end up actually getting a picture taken of him later on in the 1850s or so, um, there. Um, and so he's actually in very influential in American history. Um, and because of how influential he is, he will be your final essay question for the exam final. Okay. Um, so anytime I mention Henry Clay, you're going to want to write down everything about him for your final essay for the exam. Okay. Um, and so because he is in American history for so much, he is extremely important and extremely important for several things he does, not just because of um, how long he's in American politics. So with that, um, have a great day. I will see you all Thursday.